scorn, scorn, scorn. For a nation of such beautiful people, Samoan rugby sure does love the ugly stuff. Where Fiji or Tonga's legacy at the Rugby World Cup is built around great tries, the wins out of nowhere and the near misses they almost pulled off. Ask anyone, what's your favourite Samoa moment from a Rugby World Cup? And they'll tell you a tackle, even if they don't follow rugby. Rarely the same tackle, but almost always one you could feel from the other side of the world. Never mind the wins over Wales, the two quarter finals, or the time they almost took apart the Springboks in 2011, Manu Samoa has always been the team who found beauty in the game's ugliest moments. However, in 2019, it was pretty much all just ugly. Stories of political corruption from within the union overshadowed their lead and lacking the stars from the last two tournaments, Samoa left Japan without really ever making a mark. In the most competitive World Cup we'd ever seen, Samoa were the only side not hitting their expected standards. The one real disappointment, the team most in need of a serious rebuild. Fast forward four years though, and they may just have done that for very, very soon. An empowered, beautiful, yet oh, so brutal, wonderfully brutal Samoa side is heading directly for England, Chile, Argentina, and Japan's rib cages, and looking to make the kind of statement they couldn't make in Japan four years ago. So, how have Samoa rejuvenated their side over the last four years? Just how good are they? Because I think this has flown under the radar for a lot of people. And can they make a dent in the 2023 Rugby World Cup beyond the glorious ones they'll be leaving in their opponents left, right and centre? A large part of why Samoa was so disappointing in the 2019 tournament was just because so many of us had rich memories of what they achieved in the last decade. In 2011, Samoa defeated Australia in a World Cup warm-up before falling just short by the tiniest of margins against both defending champions South Africa and Warburton-inspired Wales, both sides only escaping with narrow victories thanks to excellent typical finishes from their respective greatest ever try machines, Brian Habana and Shane Williams. And whilst 2015 may not have brought scalps, it did present plenty of opportunity to revel in just what the team could do. Khan Fotowali, the brothers PC, Tim Nano williams Joe Takuri, Ray Lilo, and of course Alizana Tuolangi, tearing it up and pushing Scotland all so close. This was a phenomenal game. It came very close to beating Scotland. Then, that incredible generation of players that took them for two World Cups retired and the trouble began. Samoa would go through five coaches in as many years as manager after manager butted heads with the union, which had become a pretty corrupt government-led shit show worth making a musical about, I would say. For Manu Tafua, who had two spells as head coach, even suing Rugby Samoa, taking the stand whilst proceedings were underway in Japan. And things weren't exactly going much better on the pitch. Walked all over by Ireland and nilled by Scotland, Samoa's only bright spots in that tournament came in a comeback win against Russia, where they'd been behind at half-time, and an utterly sub sublime individual performance by centre Henry Tayafu to keep his side in the game against Japan until the very last play of the match. Manu Samoa slinked off home, likely more confused how it went so badly than disappointed, the only thing they offered being a few easy quid to those betting on red cards. Then things somehow got worse once the new year rolled around. The shutdown of international travel made organising games in 2020 for Samoa pretty much impossible with their squad based so far and wide in so many different leagues and all reliant on getting back to Samoa and there's only five airports that provide flights back to Appia. They didn't play a single game in 2020, and when they did come back together in 2021 to face the New Zealand Maori, it was against the backdrop of a constitutional crisis. Prime Minister Malili Galway, who had been in office since 1998 and also happened to be the president of the Samoan Rugby Union, refusing to leave office after losing the 2021 election. The issues with the union may have become quieter since Malili Galway's eventual removal from national office, but it's hard to say whether anything's actually improved on a corruption front after so many stories were breaking in the lead up to 2019. In part, though, this is down to the fact that fewer people are simply talking about union issues now that things have started to tick a bit upwards on the pitch. Not dissimilar to how we heard more about issues behind the scenes with the RFU, particularly the WRU, once the team stopped performing on the field. For that long spell without a game had allowed the Samoan Rugby Union to really get one thing right as they searched for their new coach, and then to allow that new coach to put his plan into action. For those of us who are old enough to remember that vintage Samoa side from the early 10s who beat Wales, Australia, Scotland and Italy, we'll likely also never forget the name Salela Mapasua, one of the most underrated players of the professional 
Kong Lera, Mapasua was Mar Nonu before Mar Nonu, a massive crash ball centre whose biggest attribute was his rugby brain, not his raw bulk. He was one of the smartest footballers in the game, packed inside the body of a Kraken. Mapasua would drop out of favour right before the 2015 World Cup as he slowed down, then retire a year later to take up a career in coaching. He went on to become the head of player development at Otago, whilst also founding and managing the Pacific Island Players Association, which helped negotiate better terms, contracts and conditions for Islander players around the world. All of this would be perfect prep for a job that soon came his way. For in August 2020, Mapasua was granted his dream job and given the keys to Team Manu Samoa. Taking outwards inspiration from what Razzy Rasmus had done with the Springboks, Mapasua's first task felt obvious to him. Samoa in 2019 had underperformed, yes, but worse still, they played without identity. The trademark beauty in ugliness wasn't there, nor the grit born out of love for each other in the islands that characterised every great Samoan side from years gone by. In Mapasua's own words, the players weren't a representation of our people. The rugby Samoa of 2019 rolled out could have been played by anybody. Mapasua's goal, above all else, was to get his team playing a style of rugby that felt uniquely Samoan once more and that his people could be proud of. Bigger names applied for the jobs, but Mapasua's sheer mana won out. The Samoa side he played in was incredibly tight and he strove to build a similar happy camp, an environment where players felt valued, encouraged and all bought into the same goals and values. To quote the man himself again, whether you have one drop of Samoan blood or you're 100% born and bred, in his team, it's all about being the best Samoan you can be. Whilst those first two friendlies against the Maori All Blacks were clearly subject to a few teething difficulties, you know, hadn't been there long, hadn't had long with these players, once given a bit of time to buy into Mapasua's vision, it all started to click when faced with fixtures against their Pacific neighbours. From an on-field, outside observer standpoint, Samoa's biggest improvement over the last few years has been their discipline. Not just in a penalties conceded sense, but discipline in decision making, most of all. Samoa's defence was bone crunching in 2019, but often at the expense of organisation, patience, or the other form of discipline you know, cards are plenty. Under the reign of new defensive coach Tanner Umanga, there's a more controlled element, rather than just dropping opposition players on their heads, and their attackers develop quite nicely as well. Things were cagey in that first game against Tonga at 39 minutes, but Samoa demonstrated a really lovely twist on the standard 1-3-2-2 attack. It's a basic setup, pod of 3, pod of 2, floating distributors, but I love the details here. The whole shape is so compact. When the Springboks or Australia play the same shape, there's more space between the players in the same pod than there are between separate groups from Samoa here. Tuala steps in the boot to distribute and it allows him to completely overload the short side. Molly the hooker, not to be confused with your mum, shoots up to make a winger's read but they cut it off and it leaves the actual winger backtracking against a gazillion Samoans. Space opens up on the inside and whilst the tackle that comes in is superb, this alternate angle shows the ball is stripped by Tonga rather than knocked on by Samoa, allowing Faliai to run in one of the most confused unlikely finishes of the last few years. Samoa went on to win this series against Tonga 2-0 and carried that confidence over into the following year's Pacific Nations Cup. It began well. Faced with an Australia A side that included the likes of Reese Hodge, Fraser McRide, Mark Nwangarita Nase, Samoa pulled it all together. Whilst their scrum might be a bit of a work on, these last two years the Samoan Maul has become properly fearful. If we count this against Italy, where the Maul kinda does the work before magic takes over, only Romania have been able to contain Samoa's Maul across Mapasua's 10 games in charge to date. And as I talked about in the video on them, Romania probably have the best Maul in tier 2 rugby. And this is no different. Even against a heavier and more experienced pack, Samoa were able to contort 7 points out of this line out, and from there, belief grew. It took them to that win over Australia A, the mall ripping them open before Samoa did the same thing against Tonga the following week, all on the way to the game that has, I think, defined this era so far, the moment the Mapasua way came together. Samoa played Fiji in a winner-takes-all Pacific Nations Cup finale, and it didn't start well at all. Fiji dominated possession and pulled ahead. Samoa went into halftime 17-3 down, and yet when they came out for the second half, they'd started to believe. Honestly, to just listen to Mapasua talk, to read some of his quotes, he's clearly such an inspirational figure that you would play for all day, and that started an uptick. A try from that reliable mall got things going, but their spirit and mindset did the rest. Happy to take three points, even from behind, they chewed away at that lead and just kept themselves in it. Whilst Mapasua claims Raddy's influence is more in how he 
manager's players, Samoa also borrowed their momentum tactic. Where Fiji were running literally everything because they're Fiji, Samoa would happily hang a kick the moment they went backwards and front up defensively for two or three phases, knowing that's the real hard work to make sure the field isn't broken enough for an absurdly skillful Fijian side to find space and then hope the errors come. This prime example comes right after their second penalty and from the knock-on, their relentless defence prompts, they win a scrum penalty and given another arm in the air moments later and having done the hard work to get back within seven, they opt for the corner. So Layla Lam at the back of the mall and it goes over. A relentless try machine that takes them to the PNC trophy. All of this has been bolstered by the creation of Moana Pacifica, a professional outfit in Super Rugby based in the Pacific Isles and designed to give the best players a pathway to pro rugby without having to be poached by a foreign club. Whilst there have been, let's say, uh, teething issues, this has gifted so much more game time to Tongan and Samoan prospects. Be they on-island talent, such as new call-up Miracle Fayalagi, players like Danny Tawala who struggled for game time at Kiwi clubs, or Sakopi Kepu and Christine Lady Fano, former Wallabies, gifted a chance to reconnect with their islander heritage, it's been amazing did you see those players come back together and have pathways up to the top to play top end top flight professional rugby but it does also bring us on to the much publicized other reason for mass optimism around Samoa this time this Samoa squad was already enormously proud and hugely talented, but with World Rugby's eligibility law changes the team they can name to take on this World Cup just got even more deadly. There's a handful of headlines. The poach of USA prop Titi Lamasatelli, World Cup winner Charlie Falmawina, and one cap all black Jeffrey Tumanga Allen are of particular interest. The scrum was a real issue for Samoa last summer and bringing in Tumanga Allen for the autumn helped considerably. But the introduction of Montpellier's top 14 winning tight head who stands as one of the best scrummages in tier 2 rugby at least and you know not bad at top 14 standard and a 50 cap all black could turn that problem into a genuine legitimate proper strength. It'll be of particular interest against Chile who's Strong scrum, powered by a rare man who can manage to be a human without being a humanoid, Matthias Ditus, was a big factor in their qualification. If Samoa can take that weapon of the scrum away from them, it may leave Chile solely reliant on the individual flair the likes of Rodrigo Fernandez and the Garofulich brothers. Steven Luatua, meanwhile, is a hell of a player with some engine on him who probably turned down a dozen or so more All Black caps when he signed for Bristol, but importantly also adds a real, like, legitimate, proper, rare leadership. To this side. He's a guy cut from a similar cloth to Mapasua himself, and if he beds in quickly, he could yet captain them at this World Cup. However, their biggest get comes at number 10, where Samoa have successfully recruited not just Wallaby Lele Afano, but ex All Black Lima Sopawanga. Both sublime players in their own right that should add a real steel and calm to the project. Simply having a pair of experienced 10s is exciting, but the injection of either into the starting 15 should yet strengthen two positions. And that's what makes this really exciting. Because for so much of last year, Samoa have been deploying La Rochelle's UJ Suteni in the fly half shirt. And he's done well. This is lovely against Romania. His ability to both control and attack and contribute to it without breaking the system is hugely impressive. Except the thing is, right? UJ Suteni isn't just any player. He's one of the best centres in the top 14 and the addition of Lelia Farno and Sop Wanga would allow him to slip out into his more favoured 13 shirt and strengthen both 10 and 13. Look, sure, Keith Chegwin would look good playing outside Jonathan Dante, but the glorious subtlety of Suteni has allowed La Rochelle to play with a whole nother dimension this last season. He was absolutely instrumental in their retention of the Champions Cup, the biggest prize in European rugby this season. And not just because this crucial try he scored on the verge of half time in the final, running a lovely snaking line in and out, making himself a moving target and so difficult to mark. Suteni is a rare player who is as comfortable inviting others onto lines as hitting them himself. Here in that final, La Rochelle go for what they call an 11 play. Play, which just means our first phase you play one phase on the open side then play back towards the blind side hence one phase one way one phase the other way eleven it's two ones so Tenny's body language here is perfect floating disinterested behind body is carry he never reveals his hand until the ball is in Caballo's hands all lends to eyes move to him so he begins to shift it straight away. Unfortunately, Jenkins hits Skeldon before Hastoy can call for the ball. Otherwise, it's on wide here. And rolls reversed, he's just as effective. Skeldon carries and suddenly, all three of Hastoy, Suteni and Rule spring to life as they look to attack blind. This whole time, before he's even in position, Suteni is screaming at Dante to run a hard line to tighten Leinster's defence, which he does superb. It's a fantastic line. Suteni then hits his line so late and has such a deft touch here to free Rule. La Rochelle are a good 15 metres over the game line because their midfields are so organised and have such capable 
incredible skill sets and understanding of the game. If not for an excellent bit of defence by Ross Byrne, we could be looking at a try here. Or in this example, right, we see the sheer breadth and glory of Suteni's instincts. Dulan carries it in off a kick return, and so Suteni sits in Hastoy's boot, with Bottia as the nominated hard runner. Suteni faffs around, almost staying still to make sure he's deep enough to take the ball and engage this defender if it comes. Bottia, stood out white, is the obvious threat to Leinster's defensive line because, you know, he's Lavani Bottia, what more do you have to say? So Ringrose obviously stays on him, knowing an arm tackle won't be enough, he has to full shoulder into that guy, and even then it probably still won't be enough. So Hastoy takes the ball and steps to take Byrne on. Suteni, in a split second, notices these two things preoccupying the defenders either side of this massive gap that he runs through. Like, look at Ringrose, totally baffled by the massive Samoan he forgot to mark. It takes an excellent tackle by Hugo Keenan, one of the best players in the world right now, to bring Suteni down. But this break just goes to show the double threat Suteni possesses as both a distributor and hard running centre who can cut a line. Something that comes in extra handy in a team who play rugby as compressed as Samoa, where players need to be able to take on multiple roles. Which is a trait that he shares with the only player in this squad who's arguably an even bigger freak than him. I could be talking about no one other than Theo McFarland. Every single part of McFarland's game is a threat to England, Argentina and Japan but not Chile because they're the greatest rugby team in the world. His gangly arms could potentially touch Tonga from Appia Beach so obviously come enormously in handy for line out work, passing, catching, even finishing tries like this. But the most impressive thing is the technical parts of his game are just as good. Here instead of defending close to scrum half means right foot, McFarlane is off screen with Elliot Daly defending at guard. Now, Daly obviously isn't a threat himself, but if Blocker Clark takes a further step out to obstruct McFarland, it's obvious and penalisable. The kick gets charged down, McFarland makes a fantastic scoop up, and you know what? He scores. He scores a try. He does the full rugby. He's so alert to his environment at all times. Saints have a line out on the 22 here, so the obvious assumption is that they're going to try and kick it clear. Now, this isn't necessarily applicable when he's playing for Samoa, but just to give a flavour of his game intelligence, on this occasion, McFarlane is very aware that the main man in the middle of the mall is Mauro the Menace himself, bloody Etoge, casually lifting Nick Ezekwe with one hand whilst facing the catcher. So McFarlane stays out the mall, trusting his mate Mauro to do the bastard work and make a mess of this big meat lump, whilst McFarlane barely even pushes, instead biding his time and waiting for the kick to set. As the mall drops, Saints try to tie him up, but thanks to his position on the outside and a bit of help from Ben Earl, he comes out relatively unscathed. All of Saints forwards are elsewhere, Mitchell has no protection on the box kick, meaning McFarlane can get mitt to it and punish Saints for their sins. McFarlane is a skillful bastard with the emphasis on bastard. There's no part of his game that's weaker than the last. Outfield, he's more in the mould of a Leone Nakarawa or even a Sonny Bill Williams, a ludicrously rangy runner who is quick enough, strong enough, safe enough and skillful enough that he can continue the grand old tradition of South Sea Islanders carrying the ball like a peanut, freeing up one arm to hand off or pick his nose if he liked. He often looks like he's not even trying, running this line from a standing start. You'd think he's offering no threat to the attack whatsoever, but once Good prompts him to hit the hole, his acceleration is so good he can immediately change angle, making a clean break, and then, you know what, he scores again. Theo McFarlane scores again. He could probably play any sport in any position, not just rugby. And whilst he's obviously boosted by playing in a pack as smart as Saracens, there's no reason Samoa couldn't build a similar pressure game with the likes of Lua Tua, previous skipper Chris Vui, and Jordan Taufua, all playing a similar foil in the way that Atoje and Earl do for him at club level. There's more talk about Fiji and Tonga, but I honestly think Samoa could be the surprise package of this whole World Cup. Their group is tricky, yet far from impossible. They'll almost certainly give Japan a better game than last time, and potentially could push Argentina as well. Where Tonga have recruited some flashy backs to help them score some consolation tries, the areas Samoa have strengthened are all ones that actually help them win games, and likewise, their best players all come in really valuable positions. These puzzle pieces are all being put together by a coach who looks to be having an enormous positive impact on this team in the shape of Salela Mapasua. Samoa are seven wins from eight in the last 18 months, including wins away to Fiji and Georgia, perhaps tier two rugby's most hyped up teams. All of these were pulled off without the new players coming in. Of the new players I mentioned, only two Manga Allen had played. And providing the new additions don't disrupt the squad morale too much, we could see them pose maybe the most robust test of any tier two nation this autumn. However, before we get too carried away, it is worth saying their one loss last year was perhaps disproportionately concerning. After going behind early on against Italy, Samoa just 
imploded. Their hard scrapping beauty in the brutal DNA Mapasua had been installing just fell away almost instantly and they started dropping off tackles, attacking for accuracy and conceding try after try from all over the field. Almost all of which I've seen them shut down in their other games that year. England, even when they're shit, have always had a history of putting big score lines past teams they should be beating, so I'm hoping Mapasua and co can turn around whatever kind of mental block took a hold of them that one weekday in Treviso. It was a weekend, it was just a, a week W-E-A-K day. It was a bad day. Because after an ugly few years, Samoa are finally back. Where Tonga and Fiji's World Cup history may be built on great tries and unlikely upsets, this autumn, Samoa are heading to France, hoping to remind us exactly why we all used to love them so. The style, the identity, the passion, the soul, the beauty, and the bloodshed. Nobody has ever done ugly better than Samoa. Thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. This is the start of three Pacific Island videos. We're going to put one up each Monday on Pacific Island Mondays, as we're going to call it. Now, there have been some changes. So um, this was sort of half finished a while ago, and like Samoa Scrum is much better now. Uh, they beat Japan, which we start to make changes for the script was set. and like They randomly um, called up Ben Lamb, who wasn't yeah, in the training squad. And lost to Fiji. So it's all been a bit of a state, but broadly, I think everything is still accurate. Uh, TT Lamazatelli isn't in the World Cup training squad, but also the full World Cup squad, but also this is they're going to call the player later, probably a prop, so it may well be him. We're going to find out all of this as we go. It's just some like late amendment, like the bottom on like a New York Times article when it was say like, sure, sure. you know, the uh, changes. Uh, there's been a couple of them. Uh, apologies. Um, it's the nature of trying to put all of these out and try to do all of these. There's so many more to come. This is number 12. There are 11 more around the channel. There are eight more to come, including, as I say, Fiji next Monday, and more rugby around then. And speaking of Fiji, we have watched this week Wales versus Fiji from the 2007 Rugby World Cup. And doing a podcast where we've reacted to that because we bloody hate it. Have you ever played rugby?